Well, let's get some analysis and speak with Stan Grant, who's Vice-Chancellor's Chair at Charles Sturt University. Stan, good to see you. So we know why these protests started with the death of George Floyd. We've seen these before. Why is this gathering momentum at this time? It is different. We have seen it before, Andrew. There were protests in the 1960s, 1992, the killing of Rodney King in Los Angeles. We saw even bigger protests then on the streets of LA. This is different because of where this sits in recent history. For the past 20 years, the United States has been in a state of crisis. From the attack on 9-11, lurching into wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, endless wars that damaged American prestige and drained it of blood and treasure. Um, the global financial crisis of 2008 that America is still struggling to recover from and widened those deep cracks of inequality inside the country. It has become a politically fractured country. We've seen a rise of populism that's put Donald Trump into the White House. It walks dangerous fault lines of class and race that come from its history. These wounds that have never healed and now given that constant state of crisis, we're seeing this on the streets. You, you say the United States is politically fractured. How is Donald Trump reacting to that? Donald Trump has, has succeeded because of that, that fracture in American politics. He was able to take an insurgent po populist movement, capture the Republican Party. Remember, he wasn't a Republican earlier in his political life. Captured the Republican Party, won the nomination, then won the White House, despite not getting as many votes as Hillary Clinton. He has ruled on a policy of divide and rule. So the comments that we're hearing from him now are not comments about about healing the country, about appeals to the better angels of our nature, about talking of bringing a nation together, but pointing the finger of blame, playing into those fractures that have served him well. This is an election year for Donald Trump as well, where he wants to continue to build that base, bring the support that he has with him to hold on to the White House. All of this fits into that playbook. You say he's seeking to point the finger of blame. One... one uh... Well, it's not an organisation, but a loose affiliation, Antifa. Uh, he wants to declare Antifa, which is a loose affiliation, as a terrorist organisation. Well, it's not an organisation. Plus, America doesn't have domestic terrorism laws, does it? Well, this is a country that went to war, that led a war against fascism in, in, uh, in the Second World War, that helped defeat Germany. Um, and now it's a, a country where a president is saying that those people who stand up and oppose fascism are enemies of the state effectively wants to declare them terrorists. But what we need to do, Andrew, is we need to look at this in its entirety. What you have is a country that is at war with itself. On the one hand, you will have the political right. On the other hand, you'll have the political left. People are not seeking to find any civic unity, any sense of civic nationalism, but are retreating to their tribes and yelling at each other. To this extent, all of these groups feed into the same malaise, although, of course, there's not a moral equivalency. So if you don't have that leadership at the top from the presidency, how do you solve this immediately? Well, at the moment, of course, to play into the fractures of a country is exactly what the populist playbook demands. And that's what's been successful around the world. Look at Europe, where the resurgence of the political right tapping into a, a populism there and anger amongst its, po its population has seen many of those politically right countries return to power or increase their hold on power in, in Europe. We're seeing a far-right group now, the third biggest political party in, in Germany, in the German parliament. In Hungary, you have someone like Viktor Orban who openly boasts of an illiberal democracy. The populist playbook is working in so many parts of the world and it's worked for Donald Trump. Barack Obama, of course, talked about cope, didn't he? He talked about lifting a country above its past. There are no red states or blue states, there are just the United States. Well, in many ways, Barack Obama's legacy is Donald Trump. That's what followed the Obama years. Yeah, because there was a lot of criticism while he was in office and after he left office that he didn't do enough to heal race relations. Yeah, and of course, the first black president of the United States, a hugely symbolic and historical moment. But Obama was often described as a bound man. He was the first black president of the United States, but he should never talk about race. Whenever he ventured into talk about talking about race, and it was very rarely, he suffered a blowback and he immediately retreated. It was OK to have a black American president, but not a president for black America. And remember what we saw during 
during the Obama years. We saw of the rise of the Black, right, the Black Lives Matter movement. We saw more people killed on the streets. We saw the, the protests in places like Ferguson, Missouri. It didn't end under Obama. What we did see under the Obama years was a continued fracture of that polity that led to the popular surge that helped put Donald Trump into the White House. They are all connected Andrew, to the 20 years of crisis that the United States has been embroiled in ever since 9-11, both overseas and, and domestically. And that's been damaging for the US within its borders and damaging for the US outside and damaging for the rest of us who require a powerful US in the world. Stan, thanks for your analysis. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you.